Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Patrick with Stacking Layers. Today's video is gonna be going over how to install Clipper on a brand new system. So if you've been looking into Clipper and not too sure what's going on and the, all the installation's getting confusing for you, this is gonna be the video for you to get you going, okay? So first things first, we're gonna need to go over what equipment do you need to run Clipper. I'm gonna go over to my, uh, my phone right now so I can show you what I got going on for this video. Let's get that, okay. So today I'm going to be using the SKR Mini E3 version 3. Um, I chose to use this board for this tutorial because you know a lot of people are switching with their Ender 3s or Ender model uh, uh, printers and this one is designed specifically to fit into an Ender so I figure why not this is going to be one that a lot of people not a lot of newcomers might be coming to so that's that board I'm going to be using. The other thing I'm going to be using is the uh, Big Tree Tech um, BTT Pi, uh, Big Tree Tech Pi. This is a, a Raspberry Pi alternative board. It's not a clone. Um, as you can, I don't know if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi, but if you are, you'll notice that it's completely reversed. Pins are on different sides and things like that. But in general, it's the same idea. Um, what it is, the, the important part of what you need um, is a Linux system. So you need some sort of computer system that can run Linux. And that's what this is. That's what a Raspberry Pi is. You can also, if you have an old laptop, um, this is actually an old laptop, but it's running Windows. But if you had an old laptop sitting in a drawer that you're not using anymore, chances are it's powerful enough to install Clip, or, uh, install Linux on, and then you can install Clipper onto that and run on a used old laptop. And so you can re, you know upcycle your old stuff that you're not using anymore. Um, you figure processing power and stuff like that on one of these, um, and even RAM is probably surprisingly low compared to your old computer, which you may have, you know, a, a four core processor with, the, you know, two to four gigs of RAM, and that's more than enough to run um, Clipper. Whereas this one has, it's a four core processor. I can't remember the megahertz at the top of my head right now, but it's only one gigabyte of RAM, and it does fine. I've never had any issues. I got the same style running on um, two of my other machines right now, so never had an issue. So it's definitely capable. So if this can run it, then an older laptop with more RAM and more processing power can definitely do a great job. So anyways, enough of that. Other things you're going to need, a USB cable. I'm going to be showing you how to install it um, with USB uh, connection. So this is going to be the basic setup. Um, there are other ways of doing it. You can do it. Um, I got this module on here right there, which I'm not going to go over here, but this is a CAN bus adapter. So you can install um, communication through CAN bus or you can do UART, which is another way of uh, plugging in from the GPIO pins here. These are all of your in-out pins, and then you would plug into something, I believe it's right up in here, is your IRO pin, so that's your being able to control with, with a different way of connecting without using a USB. But that's not what we're doing. I'm doing it the easy route, quick, simple. You need some sort of Linux computer system, a Raspberry Pi or something like this, a Big Tree Tech Pi. You need your microcontroller, of course. Most of the microcontrollers that are in today's printers or any of these type of upgrade boards that you can get are going to be compatible with Clipper. You need a very good quality SD card to go into your Raspberry Pi or, or Pi alternative. Um, unless, of course, you're using a laptop. that You don't need that. But I want to point this out because see that here on the down in the lower area, you see the, the little circle with the T on it. Or the T with the 10. <laughs> um, that's a, a C10, that's, that's the class, and then you also have the A1. So those two are classes, and those um, dictate what kind of speed capabilities, the read-write speeds. And that is important to not go under a C10 or an A1 with these cards. Don't go cheap. Um, get an, a reputable brand. Um, I, I love SanDisk. I know other people say they don't like it, they don't have good quality, but I've never had a SanDisk fail on me. Um, but otherwise, uh, a C10, you don't want to go lower to like a C6 or even lower than that. If you were using Marlin, for instance, and you're just loading up um, STL files, sorry, uh, not STL, but uh, G code files to print, the lower quality card is going to be fine because you're just pushing over the, the instructions. Um, but even then, I would recommend a higher just because. But what this is, is more than just loading files. This is going to be your entire, entire uh, hard drive for your, uh, your microcomputer here. So this is going to be your operating system, all of your programs, and your file storage. So you don't want to cheap out and get something. You will run into problems if you cheap out. So I can't stress that enough. Don't cheap out on the SD card, okay? These things are getting pretty cheap as they are, so you're not gonna. It's not gonna break your bank. I think this thing was like, uh, and I can't remember now, but maybe ten bucks or something like that. 
But um, so get those. Also, if you notice, I'm not plugged in to the printer at all. I have nothing on here. Um, when I upload uh, new firmware and stuff like that to to my boards on a brand new board, um, I don't hook it up to the computer. Sorry, to the printer first because I want to make sure that the firmware is up and running before I start plugging things in. Um, and that's kind of what I recommend. If you're getting a brand new board, let's do this first, get everything installed, and then you can start plugging in your things to make sure. Because once you know your firmware is good, then the rest should be pretty easy. Um, so in doing that, since I'm not having my um, my power supply from the printer plugged in to power this guy up, I'm using the USB as power. And um, to do that, you have to put on, on this specific board, there is the uh, SW USB. It's these two top pins that you see I got a little red jumper on. You gotta jump these two pins because that allows power, the five volt power through the USB to control and power up the chip. So if you don't have that board, that, that jumper on there, um, then that's not gonna allow any power. It's only gonna be data and so you won't be able to power up the board unless you have some other alternative power coming in. And I do wanna point out, if you do have an alternative power source, your, your printer's power source for instance, do not have this on because you don't want those connected. You don't want two different power sources connected at once. Uh, it's just bad news. So don't do that. Um, of course, you do need a power supply for your main uh, computer <clears throat> that you're going to be using, your host computer. Um, this one is an official Raspberry Pi, um, what is it, a 3 amp, 5-volt um, power supply. Do not use phone chargers. I know a lot of people say they use them, but they are not designed to power up these things to give a constant clean power. So you can run into issues with what's called brownouts or under voltage um, to where basically the the charger starts doing things because they are they are battery chargers, not power supplies. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of circuitry in there and they're designed to, to change voltage, a lower voltage and stuff when it starts thinking that it's um, charged the battery up so it doesn't overcharge your battery and stuff. So there's different circuitry going on. Do just stay away from uh, battery chargers, any of those cell phone chargers, things like that. Don't use them on powering this. Get an official power supply for it. Okay, so enough of that. Let's get to the computer and I can show you how to get things going. Okay, so here we are. I'm at the Clipper website. This is where you should start for anything. Um, I recommend go to this clipper3d.org and read as much as you possibly can on this just to get the hang of it. Um, with this video, like I said, I'm going to be showing you how to install things, but I plan to make this a first in a series of Clipper videos because I want to really kind of try to deep dive into all the different features of this stuff. Um, it's not going to be on this video because I'm going to try to keep it as simple as I can, and my videos get way too long, and I know you don't want to hear me drone on about everything. So I'm going to try to break it up, but this has all of it, um, everything you need to know on how to do it. And since we're doing it, we're going to begin by installing it, of course. But this is where I start uh, disagreeing with things. And I think what's going on here, uh, I'll explain to you what, I'm, what my thoughts here are. This, uh, this website, I think, is a little bit out of date. They haven't gone through and really updated with what, what people are using primarily, what the tutorials are going on, and all those different things. Um, this, all this information will work. So if you want to skip this video altogether and just start reading this and try to follow along, it, it will work, but it can get confusing and it can start causing things and issues or you'll find things that don't look anything like what people are showing on their machines that, that you know may, may have sparked you to come over to Clipper. Um, and one of the big things is, for instance, it says right here, start by installing Octopi on your Raspberry Pi. I, Octopi is great, but for Clipper, I think it's a little over bloated for what it is. Um, Clipper is all about streamlining and having full control over things, whereas Octopi really can do that, but it's so much more that it's all about plugins and extra things. So if you're running Marlin and you decide you don't want to go to Clipper after seeing this or after going through, it's just too much for you, and you want to stick with Marlin, there I recommend install Octopi on your Raspberry Pi and play with that because until I switched to Clipper, Octopi was a dream. I love it. Um, and I will still recommend it to anybody using Marlin. Get Octopi, it's amazing. For Clipper though, Clipper has um, some other things um, which I will be showing you. Um, one of the main things, I'll, I'll actually go to my machine that's running right now. This is main cell. Now this is something a little bit different appearance. It's all blue and it's got the BQ Huracan because that's the printer that it's on. So it's a little bit of a customized um, layout. 
but this is the um, main cell uh, user interface and this gives you a lot of information about your um, your printer it's 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 your full dashboard it's got as you can see your extruder information your all your motion sensing or not a sensing but all your motion information if it's been homed or not where the tool head is um, you can do your Z offsets all that good stuff you have a console you can set up macros and they all come out here macros will go over in, an, in another video but uh, you, you got it all and so when it comes to to what you can do with this machine or sorry with this firmware and how customizable it is you'll start finding that you don't really need the octo print stuff anymore everything is ready to go here and if you can't get it immediately there's somebody that's already made a macro or some sort of add-on that you can put into this and work um, so yeah that's that so let's get into installing all right so as you can see here there's all this stuff about installing octopi I'm saying forget this don't do it it's not worth it so this is how I recommend installing if you have a Raspberry Pi this is gonna be really easy for you Raspberry Pi because like I said is so well developed with the uh, the community they have things already set up ready to go the first thing you're gonna to need to do and this is gonna be for both the Raspberry Pi or um, the Pi uh, Big Tree Tech Pi is you're going to want to come and download the Raspberry Pi Imager software. This is going to be a software that we use to install or to burn an image onto the SD card. It's going to be burning the operating system onto the SD card. Um, and it's simple. As you see, it's a free download. Um, I don't know that I say free. <laughs> it is free. It's a free download. Um, really great and easy to use. It's just here at raspberrypi.com and software. This is Raspberry Pi's official um, imaging uh, program so it's not some kind of weird third-party thing that's gonna make you sign up for stuff <laughs> no ads and all that good stuff um, so once you get that installed you're gonna wanna open it up um, and the first thing I'm gonna do is just show you with uh, if you're a Raspberry Pi owner make it really easy so here it is I got the imager opened up um, so for Raspberry Pi like I said this is super simple you here, let's go back you hit here to choose the operating system and this is going to be the operating system you're going to burn onto the SD card. If in the future you decide you don't want Clipper or you decide in this that you don't want Clipper, you can just install the Raspberry Pi operating system and this will give you a basically desktop, a whole um, Linux desktop experience that you can use on your Raspberry Pi. But because we're doing 3D printing, I want you to scroll down to this first square guy that says Other Specific Purpose OS. Click in there. Then you got the first option here. Um, it should be the first option on yours. If not, it's in here. But 3D printing, so it's starting to, starting to get exciting here. And then you have all these 3D printing uh, operating systems. They're 3D printing geared operating systems. So as you can see, you have Octopi. This is going to be the one if you want to use it with Marlin firmware. This is just a clean Octopi setup without any Clipper stuff involved. Um, so that's what you would use, like I said, for Marlin. But we are doing Clipper, so you have these two options. This is the Octopi Clipper, so if you do want to try Octopi and Clipper, you can install that version. I don't recommend it. No disrespect to the developer because they do a fantastic job and I recommend it, but not for Clipper. I recommend this one, Mainsail OS. Mainsail OS is going to be um, pretty much what you're going to see on most people's um, videos or, or pictures and stuff when they're showing their their printer and how things are set up and you know with messages and all that stuff that's mainly I want to say a good 90 percent of what they're using is main cell um, so it's very well developed a lot of people using it so that means lots of uh, answers if you have questions so you click on that so now you're set to have main cell installed now you need to choose what storage device you're going to install it on so I'm gonna here put my uh, SD card I'm here wiping out my SD card. This is already set up, but I'm going to go ahead and do a fresh install so you can see how to do this. So once you have your SD installed in there, you want to get let's see, let's get rid of these first. Now because I already have, like I said, the operating system installed on here, it's telling me things like this. In this whole process, I want to point out if you see this here pop up, format disk, before you can use and all that don't do it do not do it this is windows saying hey there's some sort of 
uh, file system on this disk that you just entered and I don't know how to read it so you need to format it if you want to use this as a as a storage disk well we're not using a storage disk we're using it as a computer hard drive so ignore this do not format no 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 okay cancel ignore all these warnings yes I know it's not gonna work and just move on okay that will also happen later on when we're doing this burning process it will pop up again and it, if you click format while that's happening you're gonna ruin this process so do not format while this is going on we don't need to do that it's a it's a Windows warning that's all I can't stress that enough don't format so here we go so with one nice thing about the Raspberry Pi imager is that it most of the time will only show you a drive that you can use it's not going to show you your main drive but just in case if you happen to see it says mounted as like C drive or some other format where you know like for instance if it's C drive that's more than likely that's your your hard drive on your computer do not select that because it will automatically format and overwrite and kill your computer basically but Raspberry Pi has done a really good job to not show you that not even give you an option to show you that so um, my recommendation is if you have other things like external hard drives and stuff plugged into your computer unplug those unless you need them and have only the the drive that you want to burn your image to install that way you don't accidentally burn to the wrong one anyways make sure you're on the right one click that storage and again with Raspberry Pi this is unique to Raspberry Pi and will not work with the Big Tree Tech or other non Raspberry Pi boards. Um, you click on here, this little gear emblem, and oops, and that will bring up this uh, advanced options. And this is going to be where you want to enable SSH. You also probably want to set up a host name. Host name is is basically what the the um, the host computer is going to be named. So when it sees it comes up as um, you know, like here it'll say Raspberry Pi um, uh, local and stuff like that. You can name it to whatever you want. If you want to name it George, go ahead. Um, <laughs> but uh, just remember what you name it because um, a lot of times you can use this, the Raspberry Pi dot local or whatever you name it dot local up in here to access the SSH or to access your um, your system if you can't find your IP address. Um, not all computers, I can't remember exactly what it is you need to get that going, but not all computers let that work, but um, it's good to have it and to know. That way you can possibly uh, get that going without using an IP address. Um, otherwise you will need an IP address because um, that's how we get in, but we'll get over that in another, or go over that later. Next thing you need to do is set up a user name and password because we're going to be using SSH. This is getting the um, is a secured shell um, thing. What it is, is it, it, it enables you to use another computer like what we're going to be doing here using the Windows computer to talk to or literally go in and use the Raspberry Pi computer to control it via the Windows computer. It may sound confusing but it sounds more confusing than it is. You just have to make sure SSH is enabled. Um, so you set up the password here and that's what you would use as your username and password to get in. You also want to configure your LAN system, your wireless system. So you put in your SSID, which is the Wi-Fi's name that you connect to. It is case sensitive, so make sure to write it in as exactly how it is. Same thing with your password, of course, case sensitive. Do your password for your Wi-Fi. Um, and these are, you know, your password that actually you use to connect to your Wi-Fi. Not a, you're not making up a new password. Um, it's also recommended to put in your your country for here, your you know where your wireless is located. These are just going to help things run smoother and you know get things like time correct and all those various things. Um, also, I recommend setting up your locale. Same thing, put it to your local time zone and and where you are. And this is just going to make sure that your keyboard is correct. If you have a different country keyboard, um, I have a, a keyboard that's Norwegian um, or I guess Nordic keyboard. Um, so it's got other symbols that if I have a US keyboard here, things don't work because they're in the wrong spots. So make sure you do that so things work when you type. Um, and it's always good to have your time zone set up too because that will, you know, timestamp log files and stuff. So for future problem solving, you want to be able to know what time things happened. And the rest is up to you if you want to do that. You can normally, I think play sound is unchecked, but you can check it if you want to. That's just to let you know that it's done if you're out because this part, once we go further or to the next step here, it will take a long time to do. So when you're done with that, you click save and then you close out and then we can write. Now, 
with the Raspberry Pi, you click right and you follow through. But because, like I said, I'm not using a Raspberry Pi, I'm going to show you the next step, or I should say the alternative step to where if you're using a non-Raspberry Pi, how are you going to do that? And it's more or less the same. There's just a couple differences here. So, of course, we're not going to use a Raspberry Pi. These are all designed, all these pre-installed ones here are designed for Raspberry Pi, not designed for other things. There's different chips um, that these computers have, so you have to have something that's designed for that chip. So we go back to the beginning, and then we have the option at the very bottom here, which is use custom. And so this is basically using a custom image from your computer. So this is whatever file. Raspberry Pi, again, is great to give you this option that you don't even have to have a Raspberry Pi, but they will still burn an image for you to use. So you use custom. Now, to get this one, I already have it here, so I'm not going to download it again. But um, of course, you need to download that. <laughs> and Big Tree Tech, of course, has their own system for, for their, um, their Pi alternative. And it is here at the uh, Big Tree Tech CB1 releases. The CB1 is their first um, Raspberry Pi alternative style. This is an equivalent to a CM4 Raspberry Pi, which is a compute module. So the board that I showed you at the beginning of this video is all in one. Whereas the CB1 is, let's see, is this guy here. So you have your computer board, and then that clicks into another board that has all the uh, input output peripherals. So this has no input output. This is all just the computing power. So this is kind of like your motherboard, and then this is all of your computer case is the easiest way to look at it. This is the motherboard and all of your video and RAM and processor and all that, and this is just your USB and uh, internet and power um, stuff. But with the, the new one, it's, it's the CB1 and the Big Tree Tech Pi use the same chip, the H616. So it's the same um, operating system that they've made for it. And it, it is Linux. It's running uh, Debian 11, I believe it is, Debian 11 uh, Linux. So yeah, Debian 11, here it is, which is a very um, commonly used uh, distribution of uh, Linux. So there are two options. You have the Debian 11 Clipper kernel, and then you have the Minimal kernel. Minimal kernel is going to be something if you are not going to be installing Clipper and you want to just use this as a Debian computer, you can go ahead and do that. But since we're doing Clipper, that's the one you're going to want to download, is this, this, this one right here. Um, the other one on top here, this SHA is, oops, get out of that. The SHA is a, um, basically it's just a text file that's showing the number that will come up if you do an SHA, um, what do they call it, a hash or a checksum to see. It's just a basically way to confirm that you downloaded the right file. So it's not needed. It is recommended to do from downloading when you download something like this because if you had one bit downloaded wrong, then it can actually uh, mess up your computer. Or not mess up your computer, but mess up your image. Am I even recording here? Yeah, okay. I had to double check I was recording. My time went away. Um, <clears throat> but it can mess up your uh, image when you burn it. And so if you have one bit wrong, things might not work right. So it is a good idea to, to check it. I'm not going to go over this video, but there's lots of tutorials um, on how to use um, the built-in. Windows has a built-in. You can generate an SHA file and, and yeah, show that and then compare it to the number that you got there. If the numbers match, you're good. Um, one thing, if, if you do that, this here, the XZ, that is a zipped file. So you first have to unzip it and then check that unzipped image against that number. Because if you check the zipped file, it will produce a different number. Anyways, that's going a little bit too far, but I just want to point that out. So download this for if you're using the B, uh, Big Tree Tech uh, Pi or get your Raspberry Pi set up. Now, let's get back to the Raspberry Pi imager. So like I said, I'm using this image. So open that up, and as you can see, it's there, there now and there. Now I'm using this card that's already in there. And with this one, like I said, you can't do the thing. I mean, you can you can open this up and put all this stuff, but it's not going to do that because it's a different file system. So it's not even going to do anything here. Um, so I, just leave that alone. You don't need to do this if you have the a non-Raspberry Pi thing. So once you get those things selected, hit right. And it's going to tell you it's going to delete everything. Are you sure that's the correct one? Yes, it is. And then you're going to have to wait. 
This, depending on your computer speed and of course your card speed, like I mentioned, if you don't have a fast card, it's gonna take even longer. But this is gonna write everything to the card and then it's gonna verify it and it will take a long time. Um, I wanna say upwards of 10 minutes maybe, maybe even more, I can't remember exactly how long. Um, I guess <laughs> I can look at the time now, what is it, 9.56? See what it is when it gets back. But I'm not gonna make you sit through this, of course. Um, I'm gonna fast forward through it. But uh, I wanna say probably this is a great time to mention something new for my channel. I do have a sponsor, and this video is sponsored by PCB Way. So if you can sit through while you're writing your file and do a quick little watch through, I'll have my little, <laughs> my first video. I, I don't know how to do this advertisement stuff, but yeah, I am now sponsored and I wanna say a big thank you to PCB Way, so uh, let's check them out here. If you're someone who loves tinkering, designing, and creating, you'll definitely wanna check out PCB Way. PCB Way isn't just about PCB manufacturing. They've got a wide range of services to cater to creators just like you. From crafting intricate prototypes using many forms of 3D printing to precision machine parts through CNC machining and so much more, PCB Way has got you covered. A really nice part is their online quoting system. It lets you see the cost estimates for the services you need, allowing you to plan your projects without any surprises. As for quality, PCB Way takes it seriously across all their services and do their best to ensure all your designs will meet the highest standards. Beyond services, PCB Way offers a supportive community. Their forums and dedicated support team are there to help you to navigate through your creative journey. If you're intrigued and want to know more about PCB Way services and how they can benefit your projects, check out the link in the description. I want to give a big thanks to PCB Way for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to the video. Okay, so here we are with the message showing that things are done and we can now remove our car from the reader. So we can go ahead and hit continue. Now, surprisingly, I didn't get the message that pops up, but I want to show you. I'm just going to remove the card and put it back in. Um, since I do actually need to do one extra step with the uh, Big Tree Tech Pi. So put it back in. And you may get, like I was mentioning earlier, this format disk thing pop up. Um, some point during the the um, during the flashing or right at the end when it's done. Um, if your computer tries to reread the card after it's done flashing, um, this will happen. So this is the part I want to stress to you, do not format the disk. This is only popping up because Windows does not know how to read the Linux file system directly. So it's basically assuming that there's some kind of corrupted data on there or something like that. So saying, hey, if you want to use it for storage, which it's a storage card. So it's saying if, if you want me to use it as storage, you're gonna have to format it. But cancel that out, ignore all these warnings, don't do it, it's not a problem. It's it's nothing wrong with the the, the burn. You did good, okay? That, that's basically letting you know that Linux is now on that card and not a Windows system. Um, that being said, with, let's get this away too, with the Big Tree Tech system, you, you do, and with Linux systems in general, you will have a small drive, a boot drive, um, that is normally, um, I can't remember the file system right now, I think it's, it's like FAT32. Um, so it will have some boot up information and things that you can edit on a regular computer um, to kind of do some preliminary stuff. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. So there's two files that you want to pay attention to. It's this one, board environment, or board env.txt, txt and the system config file um, for this one we're going to use the system config file because this is where um, if you notice the little gear it's basically this is the same kind of file that would get edited on the raspberry pi um, actually here i'm not going to open it up in that program let's close this out okay so to open up these, it, it, if you notice it's not a normal, it's a .cfg, so Windows can't natively open that either. Um, so you're gonna need to download another program if you don't already have it. It's called Notepad++. It is a free program. Here, I'll actually show you the website so you can see what it is. Let's see, Notepad++, and it's gonna be the first one um, you can download. And it's this one with this lizard on a pencil. Um, this is a great um, program to have on your computer because this allows you to edit code and write code and all sorts of stuff without messing up the format. If you use your, your built-in notepad program on Windows, 
there's a chance that it's going to actually reformat the the coding. You won't see a visual difference, but it actually adds things um, to the ends of lines. It'll actually like make new line symbols in the code of the file, which will ruin it for Linux. So it, don't don't use your regular Notepad program. Get this Notepad plus plus. It's the easiest. It's free. It's safe. It's used globally for for editing stuff like this. So go ahead and download that. And that's what I'm going to open up this file in. So once you have it downloaded, you can just right click and then you should have here edit with Notepad++. So open it up and as you can see, it's a pretty simple, um, just a clean, looks like a Notepad program, but it's a little bit more involved because you got all sorts of, um, you know, you can check your languages, all sorts of uh, coding languages that you have, um, you know, C++ and so on, I think probably Python's in there. Yeah. So you got all these different programming languages that it knows how to read and it'll actually help you out with information. This is just a standard config file, so it's not going to really be that big of a deal. But anyways, the reason we need to get in here is because we need to do these lines right here. We need to enter in um, your SSID and password. So same thing, like I said, on, on uh, using this gear thing, only here we're doing it through this uh, configuration file. So I'm going to put in my Wi-Fi and password so I can get it to connect. Uh, hopefully I typed that incorrectly. Um, and then you also want to do this line here. This is going to be your time zone. Um, default, as you can see, is um, for Beijing time. So you don't really, if unless you're there, you don't want to do that. So you un, uh, you delete that little hash mark. Let me go back so you can see the little pound sign, the hash mark. Get rid of that. That's comments. Anytime you see these little hash marks, though, that means it's a comment, so it won't be read by the program. Um, so take that away, and then you want to put in your um, your time zone. And if you don't know how to find that, there, it does have to have a specific one. If you use, <clears throat> go ahead and copy this line right here. It's the, the time data control and then the list time zones. So you copy that and go to your browser, paste that in, and it'll bring you to the first thing, or at least it should. Um, it's the, the Geist, GitHub Geist, um, and then the uh, online display of that list. And so this is going to list all the different available um, country and city things that you can use. Um, so you find your city, country and city, or the closest to you to get that that thing. So if, for instance, if you're if you're in Los Angeles, you would use this America slash Los Angeles and so on. Okay. Uh, for me, I'm in. Let's do a fine town here. I'm in Europe. Uh, And then uh, Oslo, so I think is what it is. Yeah, we got Europe, Oslo, and then you just go ahead. Oops, go back to that file, and put that in between the quotes. The quotes do stay on these. So Europe, Oslo, that, that's going to put me into this local time zone. Also, make sure on your SSID and your password, leave the quotes. You do need to leave those there. Um. So yeah, the rest of it is is other stuff. If you have different type of um, Wi-Fi things, or if you have different um, screens and things like that that you're using, um, you can also change your host name if you want to. Um, you can take that out and then uh, change this to whatever you want. Um, but I'm just going to leave it to just to the stock CD one. So save that file. So make sure click the icon or Control S, save the I, that file, and close it out. The other file, I don't think there's anything we need to enter in right now, but this gives you some other options in this uh, board environment. Um, same thing, open it with uh, Notepad++, even though it is a text file. Still do the Notepad++. Um, yeah, we don't really need to do much with this. Um, but this is if you, in the future, you start doing things like ADXL um, uh, sensors and CAN bus modules and things like that. These are to um, allow uh, different different peripherals to be um, activated. So for instance, you see here it says the IR, there's this 
Big Tree Tech Pi board has an IR sensor on it. So if you want to use that, you uncomment that to, to activate that sensor. So anyways, not important for this tutorial, but just want to point it out. Those are the two um, files that you would edit to add or to change features. So let's close that out. We're good with that. Nothing else here needs to be changed, so make sure to eject your card. It's always good to eject. Don't just pull it out because, um, especially with these systems, again, this is your operating system. You don't want to mess up a single bit on here, otherwise things will get corrupted. Always shut down and eject before removing cards. So we got that. Pull it out. Put it into your, your board. Okay, so here it is. I got it powered up plugged in, I got the SD card in there and it's powered. Now with this one, it also has a jumper just like the other board for using uh, USB-C power because it does have an option of uh, uh, power supply like a, it's the same power supply that you would be hooking this board up. You can share with this one, it's 12 volt, 24 volt. Um, but just point that out, on the Raspberry Pi, you don't need to worry about the jumper um, because this is uh, the only way you can power it. And um, yeah, so your first boot, especially with these, um, I think it's the same on the Raspberry Pi. The first boot is going to take a little while because what it's going to do is put all of those configuration um, setups, the Wi-Fi and any other things that you've added, um, it's going to um, uh, put that into the main part of the programming system and configure everything for you. So the first boot can take a while. Um, it takes a few minutes or so. Um, give it if it takes if it's anything more than ten minutes and it's still not connecting to Wi-Fi, then go back and check your Wi-Fi password. Make sure you got everything entered right, because it should not take that long. But anyways, so now we got this board um, up and running, um, and I can show you here on the screen. So like I said, there was the um, that that dot local. So for Raspberry Pi, you would have Raspberry Pi dot local. Um, putting that in worked. I didn't need to get my IP address, but if this doesn't work, then you will have to get to your router and get your IP address. Both are fine. IP address is actually a good number to have anyways because um, sometimes getting into other things like SSH and stuff, you have to use IP address. You can't just use this, but it should work. If it worked here, it should work everywhere else. But as you can see, we're in, but we do have errors, um, mainly because as you see over here, I'm not plugged in, so of course it's got errors. It can't see anything, nothing's working. Um, but we're gonna go over these errors and show you what's going on. But before we do that, there's another step we need to do. We need to make the firmware so that this computer can talk to this. Lin uh, Clipper on here is the program, but it needs the Clipper firmware to know how to talk to each other. So that's what we're gonna do now. So. This is where the SSH comes in. Um, actually, I probably should have stated at the beginning, there's one more program to download, and that is a program called PuTTY. If you don't have that, so you use PuTTY. And this is a, um, it's a completely free system. Um, it, it's for emulating the terminal and stuff like that. It's, it's what you would use to get in and basically control other computers from, um, like a Windows computer or your host computer. So we're going to use that. Again, it's a free, open sourced. Um, it's no ads. It's not invasive or anything like that. And I use this actually even at work on, on a daily basis. So it's a very good um, very good program to have. And it's very small and easy to use. So don't let it fool you or, or discourage you when you see when you open it up. It, it may look a little bit involved, but for what we're using it for, it's pretty easy. So I have it already installed here, of course. And when you first open it up, it's going to look like this. And then you're going to have your host name or IP address. Now, I'm going to actually see if the if it works. So this was uh, BTT and uh, no, CB1, all caps on this one. And it was dot .local. Let's see if this works. <laughs> if not, I'm going to get the IP address. So you put in your IP address like it shows or your host name and click open. And if you see this message, um, go ahead and hit accept. If this is the very, very first time, you may not see that. Um, but this is basically saying that the um, that SSH, SHA footprint doesn't match what this program has seen before. So it thinks that maybe someone has gone through and messed with your, you know, your system and swapped SD cards, for instance. And it's like, hey, are you sure this is this is right? Did you do this? So yeah, just accept if it is. If you haven't done anything new and you come and get into putty some other day, 
and you haven't updated or, or did any type of new image, you might want to be suspicious, but first thing that is normal. So as you see, it's giving me a login. So this be um, this dot local did work on that. So for the Big Tree Tech Pi or the CV1, they have a default password and username. The username is BQ, B I Q U, enter, and then the password is also B I Q U. So that's your username and password, and it does show you if you go to their thing. This is right here. The SSH is what we're doing, um, and then there's your lo login, BQ BQ. So all the information is here that I've been talking about. Also, if you need to re-reference that, is the GitHub.com BigTreeTech forward slash CB1. This has all that information I've been talking about. So let's go back over to there. So as you can see, I'm now in, and this is the operating system running on the the, the Raspberry Pi or on onto the host computer right now. And so now I'm talking to that. And you can do all sorts of stuff. If you're familiar with Linux, you're good to go. If not, um, you have commands like ls. That's going to be the list what's in your current directory where you're sitting. So I could, as you can see with this file that we downloaded, everything's already installed. You have Clipper, Clipper screen, your main cell, all your configurations, everything that you need to go. So that's, this is where I'm telling you it's really easy to do. Um, if you use the pre-configured setups, it's going to be super easy, and there's not much you need to really worry about. But there are some things to continue going on. So once you get to this screen, you're going to want to do an update. Um, the update is very important because um, this image that was that was made that that they downloaded is is a I think it was made in March, and there's been a lot of bug fixes and things that have gone on since they made this image. So you're going to want to update to all the new stuff. Um, so you can't do it on this screen, but if we go back to the browser, you'll see I had already signed in. If you come down, you sign into your thing. This is their main cell, so now we're talking to the main cell um, user interface on that machine. So you come down here where it says machine and scroll down. Don't worry about these errors because it's not set up yet. But you come down here and you see all these question marks. So right now it's saying that all the pre-installed stuff isn't matching. It doesn't know what it is. It's not matching. So you're going to want to check for updates here. And you definitely want to do this before you move on. You want to get your system updated because if you don't, it can cause problems. Um, this part can take a while again. So I'll fast forward through this. Okay, now you can see how everything went blue with updates. So, like I mentioned, everything's been updated. So, it's it's very important to get this going on. Um, I recommend doing it in two stages because I don't know which order it actually picks. But just to be sure, I recommend doing the system update first. This is going to update. Here, I'll, I'll hover over here. As you can see, a lot. There are 89 packages that are going to be upgraded. So, that's a lot going on. Um, and this is all of your Linux stuff. This is all the background stuff that all the rest of these things are going to be running on top of. So I don't think it's necessary, but I always like to do that one first, just to make sure that um, you know you get you get the newest of whatever operating system you have um, up and running. That way, any type of bugs that have gone on there there was a pretty big bug not that long ago that um, made it very difficult to near impossible for new people to use the USB plug on their machines because it would stop reading the serial port for some reason. Um, and a lot of the Debian uh, distributions were affected by that. So, you know, updating and <laughs> make sure that you don't have that problem. So, yeah, just just bear with the system, do the updates. It does take a while, but once you're done with that, you're going to have a clean running system. And in general, it doesn't take a, a dramatically long time. Okay, we got that one done. Once you see it says package update finished. <clears throat> and then after that, you can do go ahead and do the update all. Now when you do this, keep in mind that there is a chance that it will shut down or lose connection or things like that. Um, don't be alarmed, it is normal.
Okay, like I said, you can get these connection failed messages, but don't worry, it's still running in the background. It's just the network between main cell and Moonraker. Moonraker is, oh, let's see if I can get this right. Uh, Moonraker is what basically sets up like your little network system to talk to main cell between main cell and your printer. Main cell is the user interface that you're here. Uh, yeah, not really that important, but there are these three things. You have Mainsail, Moonraker, and Clipper. They all work together, as you can see here. Um, so during the updating of Moonraker, it has to shut down, and that's why you lose connection. So you just hit try again, and it should connect again. And there you go. As you can see, updating full done. Everything is good. Um, yeah, nothing really you need to worry about inside here, but... Um, if you want, you can go through and, and read everything that's gone on. Um, there was one part that mentioned about pip, which is the Python installer um, thing. Um, so like when you when you install plugins and stuff like that, you use pip. And um, it did mention somewhere down the line, it's not, it's not really important, that, it, that there's a newer version. It's just kind of letting you know, hey, there's a new version av available. And it'll tell you the command to use um, to install it. But we're not going to do that. It's not necessary. But you can read through that, and it'll do it. So, error goes and it reboots, and again, we're met with this error. So a lot of people get hung up here because they install it, they're finally they're like, yes, I got everything installed, but then they see an error, and like, oh, what's going on? How do I fix this error? What is this big tree tech, uh, XXX, and all that different stuff? Um, so I'll show you really quick, just so you know why that this error in this include file is there. What big tree tech has done with their system is they basically just put in a, a blank printer configuration. They've, they've set up all the all the different configuration files that you must have to start with basically. I mean there's some extra stuff in here but um, the printer config is uh, printer.cfg that is your primary um, file that tells Clipper how to interact with everything. This is where you configure all of your printer configurations. <laughs> all, all the settings and like motors and what how many access it's going to have and what speeds and all that good stuff and I'll, we'll show you that in a little bit but as you can see right now it's empty but it has the include main cell which you do have to have so this this part up here is needed this is telling the printer configuration to launch main cell which is what we're looking at now um, and, and use main cells stuff um, but then it also has this this is what that first error is about that it's, it's it has this include generic config well there is no what this is saying is include this file this file does not exist right now we haven't installed that this is just putting a placeholder um, to let you know that you can use include and your your boards your generic board config pre-configuration which I'm going to show you I think it's here yeah we're, we're on the SKR mini e3 right so if you come to that big tree tech forward slash victory tech skr mini e3 tree master yada yada you come into their github i'll put these links down in the description too if you want to to do that use that but anyways you come to the firmware and then to the board there's all the different the version one two and so on version three is what we have here and then you go to clipper and you have this right here skr mini e3 v3 clipper dot config this is basically a pre, uh, a generic, here we'll just go inside so you can see it. This is a generic printer.config file, all set up with all the pin numbers and everything. So you don't need to go through and discover all your pin numbers and set all this up. It has the bulk of it as a generic file set up. And because that this is the, uh, this is specifically designed for the Ender 3, it looks like it has like the proper run currents and everything for the board already. So it's more or less set up ready to go um, for, for an Ender 3 from, from what it looks like here. Um, so what you'll do is you come to these squares, hit that, copy the raw file. This does That basically copies all that's in this file here. And then you come back to your printer config and you can actually get rid of this. So you can delete that and then leave that, that number one line there and then underneath that paste in all that information and you're set with that um, there's still more we're not ready to go yet because we do like I said have to flash the firmware but I just wanted to point that out a lot of people get hung up on that 
So if you've already flashed firmware and you're still having that issue, you're not understanding, that's probably what's going on if you're using the big tree tech stuff. Um, so yeah. So let's get the firmware installed. I'll just save and close this for now because it's not going to really need anything. Um, actually, if I do a, a restart, you should see that that will go away. You'll get a new warning. Let's restart Clipper. This is going to restart the thing and look over at the re refresh the printer configuration. So now you see it's trying to start up, but it's not ready. So it's just kind of waiting. It's trying to start and talk to the board, and it's waiting for the board to say, "Here I am," and you know, do the handshake between the two systems so it can start talking. But after a while, it'll get another message talking about the MCU. Of course, we haven't installed the firmware and it's not plugged in or powered up, so it's not there. So let's do that. Back to your PuTTY and into your SSH. So to make firmware, what we're going to do is use a tool called Make, and that is yeah, it's too much to explain. But basically, we're going to use it to make the firmware for it. So we're going to need to get into our Clipper folder directory. So you, to do that, you do CD. That means change directory, and then we're doing this file, uh, this folder right here, and that is uh, Clipper. And normally with Linux, you can hit the tab when you, after you do the first couple letters, you can hit tab and it'll start auto filling in. So if this was the only clipper, then it would just write it out. But you have clipper and you also have clippy, so that's why it stopped at the PP. Um, but then you just do the next ER and press tab again and it'll go. If you do a capital K, I'll just show you. These are just tricks to help you think, get things faster. If you do a capital K tab. That's the only one in this whole file, in this whole directory here that has its capital K, so it would automatically put it in. But anyways, just a trick in case you didn't know that. So we're going to do a clipper, oops, and then enter, and now we're in that directory. We can do ls, just so you can see that we're in a different directory now. Um, and then to make your firmware, the command is make, m-a-k-e, and then... Um, Oh no, what is it? It is a menu config. Menu config. If I remember right. Make menu config. Make space and menu config all one word. And you hit enter and it's going to launch into this. So this is your, your firmware configuration. Um, yeah, little application that's running. So this is where you're going to select all your information. Now, there's stuff that's already filled out on this one. I think it's because it was originally used as a... Um, basically, what they did is they Tech made their firmware and what they used, or not firmware, their, their operating system, and then they just cloned it so you can use it. They've erased all of the their information and then just cloned it so... Now we have it. So certain things are going to be already filled out, but you may not get any of this. It actually may look like that when you open it up with with nothing in here. So let's let's just try to get it so it looks. It, it may look like something like this. Very very basic. Um, so the first thing to do is the first line is to enable the uh, extra low level configuration stuff, and that'll as you see populates more information. Then you want to choose your microcontroller um, with this specific one, which is the uh, for the SKR Mini, it's using a STM32 board. So you want to find that. That's one right here. The STM uh, Microelectronics uh, STM32. And I'm using spacebar, or actually I'm using the, the right key, but you can use spacebar to select, or you can use left and right. Right selects it, and then left goes back. Um, so yeah, you can use space or that. Um, and then you're using up and down arrows. You can't use your mouse in this screen. Um, next, you're going to want to choose your, your processor model. Again, it may be all the way up at the top if if you haven't used this or if it's the first time opening it up. But this is actually surprisingly on the right chip for this. Um, it's the, uh, that, that one right there, the Geo B1. Um, and to get this information, I will point that out. If you're using, for instance, the Big Tree Tech boards, here, there's that uh, MCU unable to connect error. So that, that's a good sign. That's saying that it knows the, the printer configuration is good. It's just you know, trying to find talk, trying to talk to the board. It can't. But anyways, so to get your information for the board, a lot of the generic uh, configuration files that you can find will have this portion in the top. 
And as you can see, it's telling you to be compiled for that board, uh, sorry, that chip there, and then with this type of a bootloader, and then it's using USB communications or UART and whatnot. And so it's telling you how to do it, the make flash stuff and all that good stuff. Um, as you can see with this one, it's special, it doesn't work with make flash command, which, boy, I'm jumping all over the place, but just, just to point out why that's saying that when you're in here with the clipper and how to use or how to install, it starts giving you this information to use. Here's, here it is, that make flash. This won't work because this specific board doesn't work that way. And it doesn't really describe too much about that um, because they're assuming that you're using, I don't know, they're assuming that you're using certain boards or some boards work, some boards don't. It's just, it's kind of weird. So that's why I say steer away from this page and just follow along with these other tutorials. But anyways, <laughs> so if you come to sp the specific board that you're using, go to their um, Clipper firmware page and you'll get all their information that you need and what you need to do to set up. So here it is, this is the, the microcontroller building stuff and they have a picture of what it looks like. It can be a little bit different because again, this is out of date, but the basics of what you need to put are here. And so you, there you go, you have the G0B1, you have the eight kilobyte bootloader, what kind of crystal you need to to um, put in there and all that good stuff. So all the information is there. And of course, if you can't find this, jump onto the different forums and ask and one of us or somebody out there is gonna have the information to give you pretty quickly. Um, and so yeah, that's what we're setting it up as. And again, we're using USB. One other thing before we jump off this page, you see that there's already pre-compiled firmware. I, I say do not use these. Um, they may work, but these things, as you can see here, the, it was used in a commit from October of 22. So that's pretty old. Even if it was just a few months ago, it's still old. Don't use them because it may not even properly talk to the newer um, Clipper anymore. Um, so that's why we're making it fresh. Always make it fresh on a new system. Okay, update, then make. So let's get back to our screen here. So this one says no bootloader, but we do need a bootloader. It's the eight kilobyte there, kilobit, kilobyte. Um, and then we're using a board that has an eight megahertz crystal. This is important to get the right megahertz crystal because that is what um, deals with the timing of the chip. So as it's doing all its computer stuff, it's going to be you know, counting in a certain frequency basically. And if you use the wrong chip or wrong crystal designation, time is gonna be all wrong, things won't work right. Next stop is your communication interface. Like I said, we're gonna be using USB, but these are where, this is the area you would change things if you wanna do CAN bus or UART mode, um, depending on what kind of board you're using. Um, so yeah, we're just keeping it on the first one there, which is the standard USB. Um, the rest you don't need to worry about. So USB IDs and GPIO pins. Um, this last one here is if you wanna set a certain pin high, but don't mess with that right now because that's a little bit more advanced and you have to do some other things to get that going. So just leave that blank. The next step will be hitting Q. If you look down here at the bottom, it says quit. Q for quit, prompt save. So you just literally hit the letter Q and it's gonna tell you if you wanna save it. If you haven't changed anything on here, if you're just gonna make a new firmware but all this information is the same, when you hit quit, it may not ask you this. So just so you're aware of that. But if you've changed something, it's gonna make a new one. Then you hit yes and it's ready to go. But what it has, has done right now is just saved that configuration of the firmware. So now we have to actually make it. And it's very simple. All you have to do is say make, M-A-K-E, and enter. Now it's gonna go through and actually make, compile, make all the firmware that goes onto your board. So that's gonna take a little bit. This part doesn't really take a huge amount of time, but I will fast forward. Okay, so once you get back to your prompt here where you can start typing things again, it's all done. And then this is the next step. What we need to do is get this file, which is the, the clipper.bin. When you get that file off of the Raspberry Pi or whatever host computer you're using and onto an SD card, um, because this is the, the file that we're gonna use to, that, that is the firmware. Um, so 
the way I do it, I, I use another program, which you may want to download if you don't use. Um, you can use command prompts through here and copy and move it over to it. I don't want to go through the whole server stuff and do that. Um, I find it easiest to just use a program called um, Win SCP. And again, I'll put links to all these different programs that I use to make it easy for you to find. But this Win SCP is a really great system because what it does is allow you to get into. Uh, let's see, let's do a new one. It allows you to get into the um, uh, to the host computer and basically just copy paste between your Windows system and your uh, host computer that you're talking to. So it's, as you can see, it looks a lot like the PuTTY setup. Um, but it's yeah, it's a little bit more involved, so it's pretty nice. I'll show you here. So let's see. I can do the host name, I think, again. So PTT. I keep putting one. I put pi. I uh, did CB1 on this one. I probably should have changed it to pi. CB1.local. I think that should work. Let's see. Put in the username and password. BIQU. And BIQU again. And I'm going to save. I'm going to save the passwords just to have it easy. It's not recommended, but I'm going to end up erasing this and doing something else with it anyway, so no big deal. Um, and then you log in. And if it worked right, yeah. So the same thing. You get that message. It's like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, that I've seen this computer before. It's not matching up. Just hit yes. And there we are. Now we are in the filing system of that computer. <laughs> and uh, now I can come in and copy paste. And so when you did this make, as you can see right in here, it's saying this out all over the place, out, out, out. That made a new file or a new um, directory inside your Clipper directory. So you go into there, Clipper, and there it is, out. And here is your clipper.bin. That's the file that we need. This is the firmware. So you're going to want to do copy and then paste it somewhere. Um, Let's see, where do I want to paste this? I could just, I'm just going to paste it on my desktop, just because. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to put the SD card, and we'll just paste it direct to the SD card. You do need an SD card. Um, you can use the same one, but obviously, as you can see, I'm, <laughs> I'm on that computer, so I'm not going to be able to use that one. But um, yeah, I have another one I'm using. And uh, I'm just going to drag that, actually, into this. So let's get that out of there. Just shrink this up a little so we can see what's going on. There. Okay. So like I said, I need this file. So I can just click and hold and drag it over to my SD card. And that was the wrong part, <laughs> wrong spot. Let's try that one more time. Into the SD card. There we go. So it should be in there some someplace. There it is. So there's your Clipper firmware. And one more thing that's special for the Big Tree Tech stuff, you need to rename this to firmware. So you just type in firmware. And that's it. One thing I want to mention, if you noticed, I only typed firmware. And the dot bin was already there. Sometimes your system will not show the dot bin part. It'll just say firmware. And so every all the tutorials and stuff are all over the place that says it needs to be named firmware.bin. So you, you type in firmware.bin, assuming that's what it needs to be named. Well, what will happen is if you don't see this dot bin and you actually type dot bin, it'll add one more dot bin at the end. So it'll be firmware.bin.bin. Dot dot and that's not going to work. Um, it's a big, um, it's a very common thing that happens. Um, and I think, I can't remember exactly what it is. But there's an option, I think especially with Windows 11 now, it's it's like default where it hides extensions. Um, maybe it's in the properties here. I'm not going to dig too much, but um, no, I'm not going to do uh, View, possibly. Uh, let's see, hidden checkbox. Uh, file name extensions right here. So if that's not checked, as you can see, where did the file go? It says firmware.bin still here, but... It'll, it'll hide a lot of other things, like you see system, it doesn't have the .cfg anymore. So if you don't see .bin, you think I have to type it in, just don't. 
all you need to do is type in the word firmware and you're you're good to go don't don't type the dot bin even if it's not there just don't type it it is a dot bin file as you can see underneath here it's a bin file so it'll automatically add that to it so i just want to point that out because that's been a big problem with people trying to flash firmware and it just won't flash that's more than likely what's going on it's not that anything's wrong with with your system or your your sd card which a lot of people say oh you need a free format you need to do this your system's bad all it is is because you typed in .bin and now it's doubled up. So keep that in mind if you're having that problem. So anyways, now that we have that firmware.bin named properly, do not capitalize, do not add anything else because big tree tech boards aren't going to read it otherwise. So again, let's eject that SD card. And let's see. Hopefully this works because this is a boot drive. I, I think it should. Uh, where am I? Eject. All right, save to remove, pull it out, put your SD card in. And then we power up the board. I uh, don't need to film that, you know how powering things up looks. I guess I'll show it. <laughs> Okay, SD card is in, powered up. Remember with this jumper here because I'm powering it via USB and the USB, I'm just using the power direct from here. So pretty straightforward. Again, nothing connected to the printer. Everything is just straight on from the board. All right, and normally when you power this up with the SD card, the firmware is not gonna take much time. It's a tiny file. Um, it's like 28 kilobytes. And so, I mean, it, it it's immediate. As soon as it's powered up, it's flashed. And so, as long as you have your lights on and everything are fine, it's more than likely done. It's not gonna give you any confirmation that it happened, unfortunately, and <laughs> that's just the way it works. Um, the only way you'll know is by going into this next step here and seeing that you can communicate to it. So leave this powered up and on, and we'll go to the next step. All right, so now that you got that put on, you can close this program out. You don't need that anymore. Let's get back to our PuTTY system here. And the first thing you can do is LS USB, all one word. And this is gonna check what is plugged onto the USB. And what you're looking for is something like this right here. That's letting me know that at the very least, um, the Linux computer, your Raspberry Pi or whatever it is, can see the, um, the controller board so it does know that it's attached to that so that's the good that's a good thing you already have that step taken care of the next step you want to do is get the serial number of this system um, and make sure that it's actually a clipper uh, firmware that's running and to do that the, the command is ls and then you want to do forward slash dev forward slash serial forward slash uh, what is that? Uh, by ID, if I remember right. Forward slash one more time, and then you're gonna want to put a star. And the star is basically just saying find anything that matches the rest of this. So it's gonna match this first part and then anything else. And it should only be that one thing on this board. So you hit enter, and there it goes. It popped up, it found it. If you have this, you're good to go. This means the firmware flashed and you're ready. And this actually you do need to copy. So go ahead and highlight it. And then with when you're running PuTTY to copy, um, you hold Shift, Control, and then C. If you hold, if you do just Control C, it's gonna create this little thing and it may not actually copy. That's basically to cancel whatever's running. Um, so Shift, Control, C to do the copy. And then you're gonna want to come back to where you have your error, right? So now we can't, it can't see the board still even though you're plugged in. But the reason why is because it doesn't know that serial number. So you come into your printer config where we had pasted in all that information. And you scroll down until you find, where did they put it? My next videos are gonna be more about organizing this type of stuff to make things easier to find. But here you go, MCU is what you're looking for. The MCU, and then we're in a serial because we're using the serial communication, which is the USB. 
And then there's that whole thing. Now you see there's something already here. That's just a generic one. That's not gonna be the same. What you wanna do is, like I said, copy that and paste that in. Hopefully I copied it properly and paste it in. There we go. I don't know if you noticed, but the numbers here changed. So this is this is a unique number to the chip. So now it should know, let's just clean that up. It should know how to talk to that specific chip that we're connected to. And you hit save and reset. And it should, it'll probably give us another error because we don't have any, um, yeah, so we have this error. We don't have any uh, temperature sensors installed. So right now it's saying um, the MCU is shut down. That, that's saying that the controller board has automatically shut down. It went into basically a thermal runaway type of situation because the analog to digital converter, that's what ADC is, is out of range. So that's letting you know that basically this generally occurs when your max or minimum is not configured correctly um, or it exceeds the configured temps. And because there's nothing plugged in, a full open circuit is gonna be like minus 100 degrees or something like that, which obviously can't be happening. So that's one of its ways of saying, oh, sensor is not reading properly, I'm shutting down to, you know, to avoid a fire basically. So right now, all I'm gonna do is just modify so you can see what it would look like. But at this point, your system is set up ready to go. All the rest is all configurations inside here. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna do more videos to go into depth of what all this is. Um, but there's lots of pre-configured stuff already set up like I was showing you here with the SKR Mini uh, E3 V3. It is all set up with all the right pins and I'm pretty sure from the looks of it, it is set up for an Ender 3 printer because that looks like the right amount of run current for their motors, um, where the end stops are, the, the size of the, the bed. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is an Ender 3. This is ready to go for Ender 3. Um, but at the moment, I'm going to do something that I'm gonna tell you, do not do this to prevent fire. Um, don't change this part, <laughs> but I'm gonna change this just so you can see what things look like. So I'm changing this to minus 200 to basically say that the minimum temperature can go way below what it's going to be. So I'm doing that for the extruder and for the bed, minus 200. Again, do not do this. This is a fail safe, keep it at zero, or even if you want, you can keep it at like 10 plus degrees or something because you know your room, this is basically the, the minimum temperature that it will be allowed for your machine to run at. So if you're in a room that never gets below 15 degrees, then you can put like 10 degrees there because if it gets below 10 degrees then it's probably saying that something's wrong with a sensor and that'll shut down the board to prevent a fire. So don't, don't go crazy with these numbers. This is purely for this so you can see what it would look like if you have your sensors plugged in and things are working. So let's get that restarted. And then this is how it would look if your printer is all plugged in, all of your motors and your sensors are plugged in properly and everything is working correctly. You'll notice now it's talking to the MCU, which is your controller board. I can go to the dashboard. You have your extruder, your hotbed temperature. See, there you, there you are. My current temperature is at negative 96, almost, almost negative 100 degrees Celsius. Obviously, that's that's not true. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, if I even just put my finger on to give it some sort of resistance over those terminals, let's see, there's the hot heated bed. You see, I'm giving it a resistance through my finger, so it's starting to go up. These sensors are designed to work on um, on a negative coefficient, so it basically means that as resistance, as the heat goes up, resistance um, goes down so the lower the resistant the higher the heat which I guess really guys don't really need about that but just some more information about it um, and so what it does is if you lose connection of that sensor the sensor get wire gets broken or something like that it goes into this negative amount and that's why it'll shut it down that's why I say do not put anything below zero um, because if you do if you have a break in your wire and it still thinks everything's okay your heater can be turned on and the heater will be going up to a full on thermal meltdown and it'll actually, it can get you know to where it'll glow red and melt your hot end because it thinks that the sensor is still in a good range even though it's not. So that's why I say do not put these numbers like I did. This is purely 
for demonstration to show you how this works. I don't want you to set your house on fire. Um, so leave it at zero at the very lowest. Anyways, so that's that. That's Clipper. You're up and running if you've gone this far. You can go ahead and plug in your, your machine, get everything configured. Anytime you do configuration, for now, will be in the printer config. Um, the rest of the stuff, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to make other videos to go over that. Um, but this should have gotten you to the point to where your printer is now talking to Clipper. Everything is set up. Um, I can't really think of any other things that you have to know in order to get things set up. But um, my next videos, I'm going to go over what all this is, what, how to set this stuff up, how to make configurations work for you, how to modify, how to add new features and stuff like that. So if that's something that you want to do and you're new to this channel, give, us a, give me a subscribe and I will hopefully update shortly. Um, I have a little time uh, management problem here with uh, getting time to make these videos, but I'm trying to do at least two videos a month coming up here. Um, so hopefully that works out for you. And like I said, I'm trying to make a little series on Clipper so you guys can, anybody new to Clipper can come here as a reference and figure out how to get these things working. So if you like that, again, give me a subscribe. Leave me comments down in, in the description, or sorry, in the comment zone, and uh, let me know if you have any questions, if you need help, if something you're stuck on, I will help you as best as I can. And um, again, I want to give a huge thank you to my new sponsor, PCB Way. If you guys are interested in any, anything about PCB Way, getting new um, PCBs made, or even 3D printed parts, which they can do, or you know, modified sheet metal stuff for your machines, they can do it all. They're, they're pretty cool people there. Um, I've gotten some stuff made and it, it's pretty pretty good quality. I'm impressed. So I'm, I'm happy to have them on board. Uh, thank you for that. Um, also, I have some affiliate links down below in the description. Um, those are, um, you know, to Big Tree Tech equipment. If you guys are interested, I'm going to have, like, for instance, the uh, E3 Mini there. Um, if you're looking at purchasing something like that, it costs nothing extra for you, but it gives me a little kickback to help uh, sponsor or to help... Uh, fund my channel so I can get some more stuff and do more tutorials so it's a big appreciation if you use that again not required it's up to you but if you're thinking about buying something it's a big help um, and then anyways yeah I want to say a big thank you for <laughs> watching this and sticking through if you're here at the end um, I know my videos are super long but they are also very detailed so you can go away truly understanding what's happening here with no more questions and if you do have questions again jump in the comments so Hopefully that helped you out, and uh, yeah, until the next video, happy printing. Thanks for watching.